سوره المباركه الفاتحه بسم الله الرحمن أعوذ بالله السميع العليم من الشيطان اللعين الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله الذي لا يبلغ مدحته القائلون ولا يحصي نعماءه العادون ولا يؤدي حقه المجتهدون الذي لا يدركه بعد الهمم ولا ينال الفطن الذي ليس لصفته حد محدود ولا نعت موجود ولا وقت معدود ولا أجل ممدود فطر الخلائق بقدرته ونشر الرياح برحمته ووتد بالصخور ميدان أرضه والصلاة والسلام والتحية والإكرام على سيدنا ونبينا وحبيبنا وشفيعنا وطبيب نفوسنا وسندنا ومولانا أبي القاسم محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين المظلومين المنتجبين الميامين الذين أذهب الله عنهم الرجس وطهرهم تطهيرا أما بعد فقد قال الله سبحانه وتعالى في القرآن المجيد والفرقان الحميد وقوله الحق المبين بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وَسَارِعُوا إِلَى مَغْفِرَةٍ مِّنْ رَبِّكُمْ وَجَنَّةٍ عَرْضُهَا السَّمَاوَاتُ وَالْأَرْضُ أُعِدَّتْ لِلْمُتَّقِينَ الذين ينفقون في السراء والضراء والكاظمين الغيظ والعافين عن الناس والله يحب المحسنين والذين إذا فعلوا فاحشة أو ظلموا أنفسهم ذكروا الله فاستغفروا لذنوبهم وَمَنْ يَغْفِرُ الذُّنُوبَ إِلَّا اللَّهِ وَلَمْ يُصِرُّ عَلَى مَا فَعَلُوا وَهُمْ يَعْلَمُونَ صدق الله العلي العظيم My respected elders, my dearest youngsters, brothers and sisters in Iman, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. We have now reached the last and final nights of the holy and blessed month of Ramadan. And that is why in these few nights that we have, we want to turn to other topics that are of great importance and significance um, and that have to do with spiritual purification and how we can maximize the benefits of the activities that we have involved ourselves in during the month of Ramadan. And inshallah, I want to start a fresh topic of discussion. But before I do that, I want to deal with certain loose ends uh, that have been left behind from the lectures that we had. Uh, in the past, the previous lectures that we had. Uh, the lecture that we had yesterday, we were talking about the importance of the status and position of parents in Islam. And we said that there are certain areas where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given the edge to the mother. I was not able to present certain traditions because of uh, lack of time. I just want to present to you a few of those that just demonstrate uh, the area where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given the mother the edge. We mentioned, we started from the words of the Quran. Uh, where we find that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the hierarchy of rights, the rights of the mother have been placed before the rights of the father. And that's why even in the verse of the Quran that I had presented before you, verse number 14 of surah number 31, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions immediately after talking about parents, he switches the direction to the mother. So, وَوَصَّيْنَا الْإِنسَانَ بِوَالِدَيْهِ And then he says, حَمَلَتْهُ أُمُّهُ We have enjoined the human being to be nice and good to his parents. And then Allah immediately shifts the focus to the mother. He says, حَمَلَتْهُ أُمُّهُ وَهْنًا عَلَى وَهْنًا His mother carries him with fainting upon, fainting with weakness upon weakness. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala diverts your attention to the mother. Even you find in the hadith literature, we are told that a man once came to the Prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam and he said, Ya Rasulullah, man ahaqqu nas bi husni suhbati. He said, Ya Rasulullah, can you inform me, can you tell me, among all the relatives that I have and among all the human beings who live around me, 
who has the greatest right on me and who should I devote myself to the most? The Prophet of Allah responded by saying, Ummuk. He said, your mother. Your mother is the one who has the greatest right over you. He said, okay, that's number one. After the mother, who is number two? The Prophet of Allah responded by saying, Ummuk, your mother. For number two, he said, your mother. He asked, okay, Ya Rasulullah, what about number three? The Prophet again said, Ummuk. He said, your mother. And then when he asked for number four, the Prophet of Allah said, Abuk, your father. So three times he mentioned the mother, and after mentioning the mother three times, he turned and he said, your father. So it shows that in the hierarchy of rights, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given ascendancy to the mother. And that's why within the riwayat of the Imams of Ahlul Bayt, Ahlul Islam, you find that they mention that, for example, practical demonstrations of this can be seen. They say if your mother and father, they call you all at the same time. Coincidentally, your father and mother, they call you at exactly the same time. Who do you respond to the first? You respond to your mother first and then to your father. Similarly, even in terms of uh, the rewards that have been promised, there are a lot that are associated with the mother. We mentioned that, you know, the mother and father, both of them, they can be sources of salvation for you in the life of the hereafter. They can be sources of you entering Jannah and getting great rewards in Jannah. And another thing that the ahadith and riwayat indicate is your mother and fathers, they are a very beautiful opportunity that Allah gives you to erase your sins. They can be a great wasila for erasing and wiping away the sins that you've done. But the mother more so than the father. We get this from a hadith in which we are informed that a man, a very sinful person once came to the Holy Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi wa Wasallam and he said, Ya Rasulallah, ma min amalin qabihin illa wa qad amiltu. Fahal tara li min tawbatin ya Rasulallah. He said, Oh, Messenger of Allah, I am a very sinful person. I have committed so many sins. There is no sin in the book except that I have committed it. No sinful place except that I have been there. So basically, I, am, I have an ocean of sins that I have done and I feel really ashamed of myself. Do you see any chance of tawbah? Or any chance that Allah will forgive me and accept my repentance and erase, erase those sins? Is there anything that I can do? The Prophet of Allah, there are so many things, you know, if you go to see the scheme of uh, affairs, Allah has given you so many things to get your sins erased. But out of all the things, the first thing the Prophet of Allah, that he asks him, he turns to him and he says, فَهَلْ مَعَكَ مِنْ وَالِدَيْكَ أَحَدٌ حَيْ Look at the, the very first thing that he puts in front of him. He says, tell me something, you, you want to get rid of your sins, you want to wipe away the stains of your sins from your soul, tell me, are any of your parents alive? The first thing he mentions, parents. They are your best way to get rid of the sins that you've done. So he says, is any of your parents alive? The man turned to him, he said, Naam, Abi. He said, yes, Ya Rasulullah, one of my parents is alive and it's my father. The Prophet of Allah said, then that is a very great privilege that Allah has bestowed upon you. Idhab fabirhu. Go and serve him. Be good to him, be nice to him. Bring joy and pleasure to his heart. You do that for long enough every time you do that. You please your, your parent, you please your father, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to keep on wiping away your sins until you will be left with no sins. The riwayah says, فَلَمَّا وَلَّا قَالَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَآلِهِ وَسَلَّمْ لَوْ كَانَتْ أُمُّهُ They say when this person, he got his advice and he turned and he left, the Prophet of Allah heaved a sigh of relief and he said, لَوْ كَانَتْ أُمُّهُ He said, I wish it was his mother. Meaning what? Meaning that if you have Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blesses you, you have your father is alive, no doubt that is an opportunity for you to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And by being good to him, by bringing joy to his heart, you can reduce your sins and you can wipe away your sins. But not as effectively and not as quickly and as smoothly as you could do if you had your mother with you. That's why the Prophet of Allah said, لَوْ كَانَتْ أُمُّ I wish the parent that was alive had been his mother. Because if it has been his mother, it, the process would be even quicker. When you are good and nice to your mother and you bring joy and pleasure to her heart, that erases your sins very quickly and very efficiently. So no doubt, Allah is giving importance to both parents, the father and the mother, but because of the sacrifices and contributions of the mother, the, there are certain areas where the mother is given the edge, and that is why the Prophet of Allah says that yes, they, these two blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they are a beautiful resource for wiping away and erasing your sins. So I guess um, there are many other areas in Islamic laws where the mother gets special advantages. We don't have time for that because we want to proceed to other topics.
Before I do that, there is one more question that I want to answer as I mentioned. When we talked about the status and position of the wife, we got many questions. I want to address one of those because this is one that keeps coming up a lot. And when Islam is attacked and targeted in the media, when people want to show that Islam is a, is a religion that discriminates against women, one of the most common and popular arguments that they just love to bring, they can't just resist this argument, is the argument that Islam, when it comes to the position of the wife, they claim that Islam demeans the wife and it discriminates against the wife and it dishonors the wife by uh, allowing for the prospect of polygamy. The fact that a man is allowed to marry more than one wife, they say this is oppression against women, it discriminates against women. And they make it look like the way they present their arguments, sometimes even our sisters are swayed. Because they, they, we get this question even from Muslim sisters. They say, you know, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the creator of both man and woman, he knows, he is the creator of the female psychology. And he knows, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala recognizes and appreciates the fact that as a woman, when you get married to a man, you want to monopolize his love. You want to be the center of his universe and his attention. Then why does Allah subhanahu Subhanahu wa ta'ala allow for this provision. Is this discrimination for women? Does this go against women? Well, like I said, the reason why they make it look bad is because they only present you with half the picture. They don't present you the full landscape of the laws and the regulations that Islam has designed. The first response that we give to such people Obviously, they make, make it look like, you know, women are such oppressed and repressed entities, you know. A man can just go ahead and marry, you know, more than one wife and, and the woman has no say in it. She can do nothing about it. So it's like women have been, you know, power has been taken away from women and it's been given to men. The response that our scholars give to this is simple. They say, you don't know. If you think polygamy as an institution, the fact that Islam left the door to it open. And this is another thing that we must always clear. You know, the impression that they try to give you in the media, the, the, the phrase that they always use is Islam legalized polygamy. Islam did not legalize polygamy. Polygamy was, you see, when you say you legalize something, the impression you are giving people is that it was illegal before and Islam came into the center stage and instituted it. No, polygamy had been widespread and rampant before Islam came. What it, when Islam came to the center stage, the only thing that it did was it regulated it. It made laws to ensure that justice was served. So, the response that we give to these people is we explain to them the laws of marriage. What is polygamy? Polygamy is a form of marriage. What are the laws regarding marriage in Islam? If you look at the procedure, it all makes it clear and you, you come to understand how women are not being oppressed. Why? Because in Islam, the laws of marriage has been, have been designed in such a way that as far as the question of the period before marriage is concerned, Islam does not place any laws for that. It does not place any restrictions. That is, as far as the question of the initi initiation of the idea of marriage is concerned, it can be from both sides. A woman can propose and a man can propose. Islam does not lay down any limitations on that. The idea of starting marriage, anyone can start it. When it's informally, before, before the actual marriage. But when the actual marriage or wedding ceremony takes place, which is what we refer to as the nikah, who initiates the marriage? And who initiates the contract? You see, most of the time we get the Maulanas to, to do all this stuff so don't, we don't realize it. I'll give an example. Technically speaking, a man and a woman, they are permitted to recite their own nikah. If a man and a woman know the, the formula, they can recite it themselves. I want to shed light on this to explain to you how the mechanics of this works and how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has actually empowered the woman in this area and it's not discrimination against women. What happens is if a man and woman want to recite their own nikah, what do they have to do? What do the laws of the procedure say? Who will start the contract? It's the woman who starts. The woman is the one who initiates the nikah. She will have to say, "Ankahtu nafsi nafsaka ala sidaqil muayyan al maalum." That I, when the time to come, uh, when the time comes to recite the nikah and to pronounce the contract, it's the woman who will have to start, and she will say, "I do hereby give myself away to you in marriage, or the stipulated sum of mahar money." And the only thing that the man will have to say is, "Qabil tu nikah hali nafsi." I accept this nikah for myself. Throughout the nikah, the woman it will be proposing the contract. She will be uh, stipulating the contract. And all the man has to do is to say, Qabil tun nikah. I accept that for myself. When you get the Molana to do it, it's slightly different, but the principle is the same. You have one Molana who represents the boy and one Molana who represents the girl. One Molana who represents the bridegroom, the other represents the bride. When the Molanas will start to recite the nikah, you'll notice it is the Molana who represents the girl who starts first. He says, I do hereby give my client, the, the bride, away in marriage to your client, the bridegroom, or the stipulated sum of mahar money. 
So who starts? The Maulana who represents, basically when you get the Maulana to recite the Nikah, you are surrendering the power of attorney to the Maulana. But even in that case, it is the side of the woman that initiates. You will hear the Maulana who represents the girl, he will start and he will say, Ankahtu muwakilati muwakilak, I do hereby give her away into marriage. And the only thing you will hear from the Maulana who represents the boy is, Qabiltu nikaha li muwakili ala sadaq al I do hereby accept the nikah, the offer of nikah for my client, the boy. So the only thing they hear from the boy side is qabiltu qabiltu. I accept. Who initiates? It's always the side of the woman that is initiating that. Another thing we learn from this is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from the very first day of your marriage and wedding, He is coaching you and training you to say qabiltu, to say I accept, to basically just accept whatever it is that they say. But anyways, the point here is, that who is initiating the marriage in Islam before marriage as far as the question of the proposition is concerned anyone can initiate it but during the nikah it is the women who technically and legally initiate marriage what is polygamy polygamy is a form of marriage meaning who initiates it according to Islamic law polygamy cannot take place nor can monogamy take place unless the women initiate it in Islamic law the initiators of marriage are the women so how can you say they are oppressed or suppressed you cannot have a marriage in Islam until the woman initiates it and you cannot have it without their consent that's why when you get the Maulana to recite what you'll always notice is before the nikah the Maulana goes and gets the consent of the bride Without that, no Maulana worth his salt will recite the nikah. Because not only is consent of the woman necessary, her active initiation and participation is also necessary. So when they say that Islam by keeping the door to polygamy open, it has oppressed women, how has it oppressed women? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has taken the, door, the keys to the, to the door of marriage and he has put them in the hands of women. And this applies to polygamy as well. It's in their hands. When they want, they can initiate it. When they don't want, they can close that door. And that's why really, the ulama, this is what they say. Women have been oppressed? No. If today all of the women of the world were to gather together and make up their minds that we are not going to marry a man who is already married, there will be no polygamy. Women, if they want, they can end this. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then why did he keep the door open to this? Why didn't he just come and ban it? Well, first of all, Allah, you have to see he regulated it. And the second thing is Islam is the only religion in the world that actually advocates monogamy. And that establishes it as a principle. Because the verse that talks about polygamy is the worst, the same verse in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that وَإِنْ خِفْتُمْ أَلَّا تَعْدِلُوا if you fear that you will not be able to do justice, then marry only one. And this is the principle that generally people follow. If you fear that you cannot be able to do justice, you are not allowed and you're not permitted to marry more than one wife. Why were they allowed in that period? Well, because obviously you have to understand the context. The Holy Prophet he used to take part in these battles to defend the city of Medina. Many of the companions of the Prophet would get martyred in these battles. They would leave behind orphans and widows. Who would take, take care of those orphans and widows? There was no one for them because they had lost their men. So what would happen? The women in Medina would approach their husbands. They were so altruistic and selfless. They would approach their husbands and they would say, look, these are our sisters and they have children. They have no one to look after them. So we are permitting you. We are actually telling you, marry them. We don't mind that as long as you do justice. So basically, this was a law. The, the reason why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala left the door open to it was out of his mercy to take care of those poor widows and orphans in Medina who had no one to take care of them. But again, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He does not open any door except that He regulates it. The regulations are so strict that every man will think a hundred times before ever even dreaming about this. Why? Because the Prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, He has a hadith in which He makes it very clear. He says, Man tazawwaja akthara min wahidatin falam ya'dil baynahuma fi nafsihi wa fi qasmihi the Prophet of Allah says, any man who marries more than one wife and then does not do justice. And you know the kind of justice that is prescribed in such a case is absolute justice. Meaning you do anything for one, you have to do the same for the other. It has to be absolutely the same. Your treatment has to be absolutely the same. The Prophet of Allah says, you fail to do that on the day of judgment, such a man will be raised with one side inclining one part of his body will be inclining to the ground. Basically, the punishment is literal. If you incline to one more than to the other, you are raised on the day of judgment. In such a humiliating condition, 
Ilanar, and the Prophet says such people will be sent to the fire of hell. So it's very strict. It's not easy. It's not what women fear that you know Allah Subhanahu wa Taala has just given them a blank license to go and you know uh, marry as many women as they please. No, this was a responsibility. This was something that was given to them to address the needs of that time, and that is why whenever such a situation arises, that's why Islam has left the door open. But otherwise, the laws. And the regulations are so strict, the justice is so absolute that most, for this reason you find, that's why you find today in most of the Muslim communities around the world, we don't have this practice anymore. Because most men, they'll tell you one wife is such <laughs> yeah, a great jihad. How about, you know, marrying more than one? That will just, you know, that will be too much for them. So that's why they don't do it. So really, the response that you need to give to these critics is that Islam has not oppressed the women. If it left the door to polygamy open, it took the keys and it placed those keys in the hands of women. It's in their hands. When they initiate it, you will have polygamy. When they don't initiate it, you won't have polygamy. In our societies, the reason why we don't have polygamy is because women don't initiate it. So it's in their hands. If it is in their hands, where have they been oppressed? Where is the oppression? Where is the dis discrimination? Allah has empowered them by giving them the right to initiate marriage within Islamic law. Allah has given them the right and He has empowered them to protect themselves and their interests. So really this is a baseless claim and a baseless accusation that they level against Islam and you can always uh, rebut it and counter it by providing this picture, the, the full and complete picture. Like I said, whenever you present it, all the doubts will disappear. Anyways, there are a lot of other criticisms and arguments. We don't have time for those. As I said, these are the last nights of the holy month of Ramadan. We want to discuss certain very vital and important issues. And one of those has to do, as I had mentioned in one of the earlier lectures, one of the aims of the holy month of Ramadan and one of the things that we should strive to achieve during the holy month of Ramadan is excellence and perfection in the area of akhlaq. As we mentioned, the Prophet of Allah has said that Ayyuhannas man hassana minkum fi hadha shahri khuluqahu kana lahu bidhalika jawazun ala sirat yawma tazillu fihi al-aqdam. The Prophet of Allah said, whoever improves his akhlaq in this month, tries to enhance it, improve it, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will make it very easy for you to cross the bridge of Sarat on the Day of Judgment. When we come to the realm of Akhlaq and we look at our daily lives, one of the greatest challenges that we face in the area of Akhlaq and which really the fast is designed to empower us against is this destructive human impulse that we refer to as anger. Anger is one of those things Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has designed the fast to give you control over this thing. And in the area of akhlaq, there is nothing that is more deadly and that is more catastrophic than, akh than anger. Anger is the real enemy of your akhlaq. It's a very destructive human impulse. And that's why we need to study and find out what guidance and wisdom we can glean from the Holy Quran and from the teachings of the Prophet and Ahlul Bayt salam, on how to deal with this threat. Because like I said, it, even within the context of the fast, if anything can ruin the fast on a spiritual level, it is anger. That's why we have a riwayah that has been narrated by our sixth Imam, who narrates on the, on the authority of the fifth Imam, Imam Muhammad al Baqir, salawatullahi wa salam, who alayhi. He mentions that Sami'a Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam. Imra'atan tasubbu jariyatan laha wa hiya sa'ima. Fada'a laha bil the Imam says the, the Holy Prophet in his presence, he once observed that a woman who was fasting, she was in a state of her fast, but she was scolding. Her slave girl had made a mistake or something. She began to scold her slave girl and she was reprimanding her using very abusive language and she was being very harsh with her. When the Holy Prophet observed this, he noticed this. The Imam says he ordered that water should be brought and it should be given to her, to this woman. So when water was brought and presented to this woman who was scolding her slave girl, the woman turned to the Prophet of Allah, she said, Ya Rasulullah, inni sa'ima. She said, Ya Rasulullah, I cannot take water because I am fasting. At that moment, the Prophet of Allah gently turned to her and he said, He said, how can you be fasting when you just did what you did? The manner in which you spoke to your slave girl is not reflective of a person who is fasting. This is not the way you behave when you are fasting. So, How can you be fasting when your behavior is not reflective of the fact that you are fasting? Then he said, He said, do you not know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has not kept fasting as a means of abstaining from food and drink? No. The Prophet of Allah said, 
Rather, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has designed fasting to act as a hijab. Fasting is a form of hijab. It is a curtain, it is a veil and a covering that is meant to protect you from all the fawahish, from all indecencies and from all acts of immorality, whether they be on the level of what you say or whether they be on the level of what you do. The aim of fasting is to perfect your akhlaq and to perfect your spirituality. And that's why it is very important. During the holy month of Ramadan, we should train ourselves in this area. We should exercise all the powers that we have towards bringing this destructive impulse under control. Because it is very important, especially for those of us. The goal of fasting is to attain taqwa, right? But you cannot attain taqwa without undergoing this process first. The, the process of controlling your anger, bringing it under control, becoming in control of yourself. Without this, you cannot reach taqwa. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the verses of the Quran that are recited, verses 133 and 134 of surah number 3, surah Ali Imran, look at what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says. In these verses, He makes an announcement. He makes a declaration that is aimed at all human beings. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَسَارِعُوا إِلَى مَغْفِرَةٍ مِّن رَبِّكُمْ وَجَنَّةٍ عَرْضُهَا السَّمَاوَاتُ وَالْأَرْضُ أُعِدَّتْ لِلْمُتَّقِينَ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala addressing all the, his servants, all the human beings, he says, سَارِعُوا Compete and rush with one another. Compete with one another, why with one another, and rush towards the maghfira, towards the forgiveness that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is prepared to offer, and rush towards the jannah, which encompasses the heavens and the earth. It is so large in size that it encompasses the heavens and the earth. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, these two things that He's offering, they're not for everyone. His forgiveness, His special forgiveness, and this great and amazing Jannah that He has created, which encompasses the heavens and the earth, He says it's not for everyone. It has been prepared exclusively for the muttaqin, for the people who have taqwa. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in verse number 134, He goes on to describe the profile. He goes on to describe the distinguishing features, the salient features of the muttaqin. Who are the muttaqin? What kind of people are they? And what are their qualities and traits? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions the first quality is الَّذِينَ يُنْفِقُونَ فِي السَّرَّائِ وَالضَّرَّائِ Their first quality is they spend in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in good times as well as in bad times. In prosperity as well as in adversity. This really requires iman. It's easy to spend your money when the times are good. You know, when the economy is booming, your wallet is full of money, it's easy to spend of that money in the way of Allah. But when times are tough, in times of recession, in times of economic stagnation, a person, only a person who has full iman in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can spend his hard-earned money in the way of Allah. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says the first quality of the mutaqeen is they spend their money in good times and in bad times. They keep on spending in the way of Allah. It doesn't stop them. That's their first quality. The second quality is wal kaazimin al ghayz and those who when they are angered, they swallow and suppress their anger. This is a very critical stage that you have to go through before you attain taqwa. You cannot attain taqwa until unless you bring your anger under control. And really, the reason why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if you turn to the Holy Quran, you turn to the hadith and literature and teachings of the Prophet and Imams of Ahlul Bayt, you find they have laid so much stress and so much emphasis on this idea, the importance of controlling your anger, anger control and anger management, you'll find a lot of emphasis. The reason why there is so much emphasis is because Anger is not only dangerous and bad for you on a spiritual level. Even from a medical perspective, if you look at it, physiologically the effects that anger has on you, they are very dangerous for your health. Doctors will tell you that when you become angry, very angry, your heart rate, your heartbeat, it goes up. Your blood pressure goes up. Adrenal, adrenaline is released in your bloodstream and other energy hormones are released which, have, which they, they take their toll on your health. So even health-wise, it is not good for you. And people who are not in the habit of controlling their anger, they suffer from a variety of medical and psychological ailments and conditions. So, plus, even if you look at it from a social perspective, it's not just spiritual and physiological. Socially, anger is such a destructive and deadly and lethal force in our lives. It causes so much damage. It has spoiled and broken so many homes. It has wrecked so many families. It has started wars. It has done a lot of damage in the life of this world. And you find it... It's something that is prevalent even today. In this modern world, one would have hoped that with all these advancements, life has become so much more simple. Everything is so fast, so quick, so simple, and so smooth. You would hope that the result of this would be that you'd find people would become more relaxed. 
but the opposite is actually true. As, we, as technology keeps on progressing, and as we keep on advancing, anger levels are going higher and higher. You find anger everywhere. You find it in the workplace, you find it at, at, at campuses, and at college, at university, even on the road. You have so many instances of road rage. People losing their cool and losing their temper on the road. So there is so much frustration and so much anxiety which results in this anger and it creates so many problems. Not just for you, but for the people around you as well. They suffer. If you have issues in the area of anger, the people around you, your family, your friends, your relatives, they have to suffer as a result. To save you from all that pain and agony and suffering, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala instructs you in the Holy Quran to swallow and suppress your anger and he is so merciful, he didn't need to offer any rewards from th for this because this is for your own good. Swallowing your anger is good for your social life, it's good for your physical and mental life, it's good for you. So if Allah is asking you to do something that's good for you, he shouldn't offer you rewards, but he does. It's his mercy and his love that to incentivize you to work harder on bringing this dangerous impulse under control, he offers you rewards. What are the rewards? You find the Holy Prophet of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi wa alihi wa sallam, When speaking about the benefits and advantages of soloing anger, he says, Wajabat mahabbatullahi ala man ughdiba fahalim. The Prophet of Allah says, those people who are in the habit of soloing their anger and controlling it, not pouring it out on others, the first gift that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives them is he makes his mahabba, he makes his love wajib for such people. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala truly loves such people. This is the greatest gift. That the people who are in the habit of controlling their anger, they become beloved in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Similarly, our sixth Imam, Imam Ja'far al-Sadiq salawatullahi wa salam hu alayhi. He used to preach that man kavama ghaydahu wa huwa yaqdiru ala infadhihi mala Allahu qalbahu amna wa imana. The Imam says, anyone who controls and swallows and suppresses their anger, while they are in, while they have the ability to vent it out, you can pour out your anger, but you control it. If you do that, the Imam says, "Mala Allahu qalbahu amna wa imana." Allah Subhanahu wa Taala will fill your heart with the sweetness of iman and with the sweetness of peace. He will fill your heart with peace and security and with the blessing of iman. Similarly, the Imam used to say, "Man kavama ghaydahu satar Allahu auratahu." Those people who control their anger, Allah Subhanahu wa Taala covers and conceals their defects and their mistakes in the life of this world as well as in the hereafter. So there are so many benefits that are associated even on a spiritual level in the life of this world and in the hereafter. If you control this impulse, bring it under control, it can really simplify your life. Because a lot of people, they suffer in the life of this world and they will suffer in the hereafter and in barzakh as well because of not being able to control your anger. Sometimes, you know, this is such a routine thing and such a regular thing that we sometimes take it lightly. We don't realize how serious it is and how seriously Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala takes it. Particularly because anger, if it is not controlled, if it does damage to yourself, Allah can forgive that. But the damage that it does to other people, that is what you need to worry about. Hukuk nas that is very important. That can get you into real trouble. That's why I'll relate to you the story of Sa'ad bin Ma'ad which I'm sure many of you must have already heard, that this is a distinguished companion of the Prophet Sa'ad bin Mu'adh. He played a very important role in spreading Islam in Medina. He was a very illustrious companion of the Holy Prophet. And as you all know, he met his martyrdom in the Battle of Khandaq, in the Battle of Ahzab. A, they say a stray arrow, it struck him in the foot and he developed an infection and as a result of which he died. We are told when he was martyred, when he passed away, the Prophet of Allah was so grieved, he was so sad that he came out of his house without his Aba. And they say when he was walking towards the masjid to lead the funeral procession, you find he was tiptoeing, he was walking on his toes. When the people asked, why are you doing that, Ya Rasulullah? He said, you have no idea how many thousands of the angels of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala have come down to attend his funeral prayers. Such a distinguished companion. So we are told the Prophet leads the Salatul Janazah and then he personally escorts the Janazah to the graveyard and he buries him with his own hands. After that, after the burial was complete, they say the mother of Sa'ad bin Mu'adh, she came and stood on the grave of Sa'ad bin Mu'adh. And she had seen the honor that the Prophet of Allah had given this companion. She had heard about the angels who had descended to pray salah behind the Prophet for Sa'ad. So she was very happy. She tur turning to Sa'ad, she says, Hani and lakal jannatu ya Sa'ad. Standing on his grave, she addresses her son and says, Oh Sa'ad, you are so lucky, I give you the glad tidings of Jannah. 
Congratulations to you that you received such great honors. As soon as the Prophet heard her say this, he turned to her and he said, La tajzumi ya umma sa'ad, fa innahu tusibuhu fil qabri dhagtatul qabr. The Prophet of Allah said, Not so fast, O mother of Sa'ad, don't congratulate him yet. Because right now you don't realize he is undergoing punishment in the grave. The Adab al Qabr has started and he's undergoing the squeezing of the grave. The companions of the Prophet of Allah, they were alarmed. They turned to the Prophet of Allah, they said, Ya Rasulullah, such a distinguished companion and he receives Adab in the grave. Why? The Prophet of Allah said, Innahu kana sayyi al khuluqi bi ahlihi wa wuldihi. The Prophet of Allah said, no doubt, he was a very pious and a very good man and he contributed a lot to Islam, but he had one flaw, one weakness in his personality, which is what? He had very bad akhlaq and he was very ill-tempered with his wife and his children. Because of this, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, eventually he will forgive him and he will make him enter Jannah, but because of this, he will first have to go through this punishment to purge him of the sins that he committed in this area. You can see how serious it is. When Sa'ad bin Mu'adh, such a distinguished companion of the Prophet, is not saved from the punishment of Allah because of the mistakes that he made in this area, then who are we? You and I, we cannot expect to be saved from this. And you know, this is, this is very important because a lot of the times, many people, uh, when it comes to our family and our relations with our family, you find the people who suffer the brunt, those people who have issues in the area of anger, the people who bear the brunt of this are the family members. Because what happens is many times you find people go to work, you get upset at your work, someone, ignore, uh, someone you know, provokes you or angers you, you suppress your anger at, at the workplace because you can't afford to vent it out over there because it will create problems for your job. So what do you do? You, come, you take all that anger and you suppress it inside of you and you come back home and who do you vent it out on? You went it out on the usual candidates, the poor Bairi Bacha. They are the ones who have to suffer everything, everything wrong that, goes, that happens in the workplace. They bear the brunt of it at home. And the reason why you do it is because you think, you know what? At the workplace, if I, you know, or at, at anywhere else, if I went out my anger, there will be consequences. At home, you feel there will be no consequences because Bairi Bacha, what's the most that they can do? They can't do anything against you. Well, you have to understand Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves all his servants equally. If you do anything to hurt the feelings of or to insult or you do anything bad to any of his servants, even the Bairi Bacha, they are also the servants of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So if you do anything wrong to them, Allah will make you pay for it in the barzakh or on the day of judgment. You cannot get away with it. So this is something that we really need, need to take seriously. If a distinguished companion of the Prophet of Allah like Sa'ad bin Ma'ad, if he couldn't get away with it, then you and I, there is no chance that we will get away with it. That's why we have to be very careful. The way we behave with our fellow human beings, anger must be controlled under all circumstances. Otherwise, it will create problems for you. Even if it does not, you see, the Imams of Ahlul Bayt, for example, the sixth Imam, Imam Ja'far al-Sadiq sallallahu wa sallam, he informs us, he would, when addressing his followers, he would try to make them understand how important this issue is. He would say, don't take anger lightly. You think anger is just, it's human to become angry. Yes, it is human, but it is not human to pour that anger. You have to control it. If you don't, the Imam informs you, he says, Inna lillahi baban finnar la yadkhuluhu illa man shafa ghaidhahu. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you know, we mentioned Jannah has got many doors. Every good deed has a door. Jahannam also has doors. And he says, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has prepared a special entrance in the fire of hell for those people who have problems in the area of anger. Man shafa ghaidahu, a person who is in the habit of not swallowing their anger, you, every time you get angry you spill it out on others, there is a special door for such people in the fire of hell. They will be made to enter through that door. So that's why there is a lot of emphasis that, that is being given on this, that you need to, whenever you get angry, you need to suppress it, control it, do not pour it out on others because it will really mess up things for you. Not just in the life of this world, in Barzakh and in the hereafter as well. That's why I want to share with you a beautiful tradition that has been narrated by our 8th Imam, Imam Ali ibn Musa al-Rida, salawatullahi wa salamuhu alayhi. He informs us on the authority, and this is one of the golden chains. It goes all the way, the chain goes all the way to Amirul Mu'mineen. He is the one who narrates. A man once came to the Prophet of Allah and he said, Ya Rasulullah, Alimni Amalan La Yuhalu Bainahu Wal Jannah. <clears throat> he said, Ya Rasulullah, I want to teach I want you to teach me of an amal, which if I do, it will clear all the obstacles between me and Jannah. You see, a lot of people eventually because Allah is so loving and forgiving and merciful, a lot of people will go to Jannah. But not before they suffer punishment. 
many people who have committed sins, who have violated the rights, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, before He sends them into Jannah, he will, he will purge you of the sins that you commit. You know, that's why many people, when we talk about the forgiveness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, many people think, okay, well then, you know, we don't need to stay away from sins because we can do all the sins and then do istighfar and Allah will forgive us. Yes, even when Allah forgives you, you sometimes have to. There are some sins for which you still have to pay the price. And Allah purges you of those, of those sins by sending different kinds of misfortunes and calamities in this world, in barzakh, and even in the hereafter, there will be punishments that will be designed to purify you from the stains of the sins that you've committed. So you can't take the issue of sin lightly. This person comes to the Prophet of Allah and says, Ya Rasulullah, I want you to tell me something. Tell me, give me tips. If I want to clear the path between me and Jannah, I basically want to enter Jannah hassle-free. A lot of people will enter Jannah after hassle, after going through so many different punishments through which they'll be purified of the sins. They will have to give hisab here and there. He says, I don't want any of that. I don't want any hassles. I want my path to Jannah to be very straight and very smooth. No hassles. The Prophet of Allah says three things. Three tips he gave this person. What were those? The first thing he mentions is if you want Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to remove all the obstacles between you and Jannah, you want to clear your way, the first thing is la taghdab. Bring your anger under control. Can you imagine? The very first piece of advice that the Prophet of Allah gives him is bring your anger under control. This is the thing that really messes up your path to Jannah, anger. Bring your anger under control. Number two, he says, وَلَا تَسْأَلِ النَّاسَ شَيْئًا When you have hajat, ask only from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Ask from the Creator, do not ask from the creation. And the third thing that the Prophet of Allah says is, وَرْضَ لِلنَّاسِ مَا تَرْضَاهُ لنفسك. Desire for your fellow human beings, what you would desire for yourself. This is a golden principle. You find it throughout the teachings of Islam. So you do these three things, and the Prophet of Allah says, your path to Jannah will be very secure. It, you won't have to go through any hassles before Allah makes you enter Jannah. So really, the first thing that, as we've said, the Prophet mentions is control your anger. Swallow it. That will really ease the path to Jannah. But now, there is a very important point that needs to be made here. There are a lot of people who are very good at the first stage. You see, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, this verse of the Quran that I presented before you, verse number 133 of surah number 3, it is very comprehensive. When it comes to the issue of anger management and anger control, it is very comprehensive. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not end the narrative over there by mentioning that the muttaqin are the people who are wal kazimin al ghayz that they swallow and they control their anger. That's not the end of the story. See, a lot of people, they're very good at swallowing the anger. But that's just the first stage. There is something that is even more difficult that you have to do beyond that. Because what happens is, let's say someone angers you or provokes your anger. You get really angry, but you remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala at that moment. And for His pleasure and for the benefits that He has promised you, you suppress it. That suppressed anger is not just going to vanish and disappear in thin air. You can't just expect that you will swallow your anger and it will just disappear. No. Anger has a tendency to linger. It has a tendency to build up inside you. If you keep on swallowing and suppressing your anger, it's not enough to swallow it and suppress it. You have to channelize it. You have to find creative methods to deal with it. You can't just let it go inside of you. Otherwise, it will gather inside you and it will accumulate and you will implode from within. It will consume you from within. The other thing that anger can do sometimes is if you are in the habit of swallowing it and, and bottling, up, bottling it up inside, what happens is the anger goes inside you and it transforms and metamorphoses into other feelings. Like it can develop into, into grudges, into resentment, into hatred, jealousy, suspicion, mistrust. All these different emotional feelings, they are produced by suppressed anger. So basically, once you have swallowed the anger, that's not the end of your challenge. That's not the end of the story. You have to work on it. You have to do something about it. Otherwise, like I said, it can do a lot of damage to you from inside. Especially when anger is suppressed and it's bottled up and it turns into resentment, that can create a lot of problems for you. Because as a wise philosopher once said, he said, resentment is like taking poison while hoping the other guy dies. Because what you're doing essentially is when you hate someone or you resent them, you're not harming them. By hating someone, you're doing no harm to them. The only person you're harming is yourself. You will notice if you, if you are in the habit of this, you will find that your personal relationships are suffering as a result of that. It will mess up your spiritual as well as your social life. So the best way to do, the best thing to do is after you swallow the anger, you need to find out ways to creatively channelize that anger. And that's why there are many methods that are prescribed. How do you channelize that anger? If you turn to Western literature, there are many interesting ways of doing that. For example, many psychotherapists, uh, 
those people who suffer from anger or anger management issues, they sometimes give them inanimate objects. Like they'll give you a pillow or a football or a balloon or a cushion or a pillow, something of that sort. And they tell you when you feel really angry, just punch the, kick the hell out of the pillow or the, the balloon that they have given you. Basically the idea there is, went out your anger on inanimate objects rather than on animate people. Because doing it on an inanimate object is way better than doing it on a real person. Because when it's a real person, there are real feelings involved. You can do irreparable damage to the feelings of that person. So the best idea is, instead of doing it on the real person, you do it on an inanimate object and that's how you channelize it. And you know they say, generally speaking, when it comes to these methods, their, effect, their efficacy and their effectiveness is only temporary. The best solutions I'll, I'll tell you, you'll get from the Quran and the Imams of Ahlul Bayt. But temporarily and momentarily these solutions might be effective and sometimes you know these creative approaches can actually help you in some cases. And uh, you know it, it also shows, I was reading this book and it made me realize that you know women, generally speaking women are better. They're more, they're better ex experts at channelizing anger and you know finding out different creative methods to vent it out rather than doing it on, on, on other people. I never used to believe this because I had read Shakespeare and Shakespeare says that, you know, hell hath no fury like a woman scorned. So apparently their anger issues, their anger is a very dangerous. But I was reading this book by an anger management specialist and he writes, he relates a personal episode uh, that really shows that women definitely are better and they are more creative at dealing with their anger and, and you know, especially when it comes to channelizing it. So he writes about his own uh, uh, personal episode. He says, I was once chatting with my wife and I turned to her and I, I asked her this question that had been bothering me for quite some time. I turned to her and I said, you know, darling, I've noticed one thing, that I as your husband, I get angry at you all the time. I lose my temper on you, sometimes for no fault of your own. You know, men, sometimes that's how they are. They'll just get angry at you for no reason, for no fault of your own. So he tells his wife, he says, you know, I have noticed that I get angry at you all the time. And when I get angry, I lose my temper on you. I burst and I do all those things. But you never reciprocate. You know, the, the thing that I really admire about you is I do all of that and you never lose your cool. You never lose your temper on me. How do you do that? I want to learn from you. I want you to educate me. How do you do that? His wife was like, nah, you know, it's just, it's my nature and that. He's like, no, no, I don't want to listen to any of that. I really want to know practically, how is it that you do? Is it like, I mean, do I never cause you to become angry? She was like, hell no. There are times when I just feel like smothering the life out of you. So he said, well, then what, how come you never get angry at me? You never pour out and vent that anger. She said, well, it's not that I don't get angry at you. I just have better, more creative ways of channelizing and, and you know causing that anger to evaporate basically I have more creative ways of doing that he was like well enlighten me educate me I want to learn from you how do you do it she said nah you don't want to know about it he was like no I want to know I insist I want to learn I want to be more like you she's like well okay if you insist I'll tell you I have this one method that I follow whenever you make me angry like really angry what I do is I go and I mop the floor I thoroughly mop the kitchen floor or the bathroom floor. I just mop it like really thoroughly. And when I'm done mopping it, I find that my anger for you has been mitigated. It has been alleviated. It, it just disappears. Now, when the man heard that, he was like, what? Mopping the floor alleviates and reduces your anger for me. I don't buy that. I mean, you've got to be kidding me. How can mopping the floor reduce your anger for me? I, 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 I simply refuse to buy that. He was like, well, you see, you don't know exactly how I do it. Otherwise, you'd not just be buying it, you'd be selling it. He was like, well, how do you do it? Educate me. She said, well, actually, it's not so much the act of mopping the floor thoroughly that reduces and alleviates and dilutes my anger. It's what I do it with that does the trick. I do it with your favorite shirt. <laughs> Incredible. So, I know, I can see some of you are looking at your shirts. <laughs> well, any married sisters listening to this, I'm not giving you any ideas here, okay? The idea is to show you that in Western psychology, this is a fact that is established that, you know, it's always better and it's considered more creative if you do it on inanimate objects rather than you do it on a real person with real feelings because the damage that you'll do there will be truly irreparable. But you know what? When we come to the Quran and Ahlul Bayt, they give you much better solutions than that. You don't need to go for these kinds of solutions. Because the Holy Quran, the words that I recited, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives you a solution and a method for dealing with that pent up anger. And it's such a beautiful method, I know it will sound very counterintuitive. 
Because many of you will be like, whoa, is that the solution? But no, it's very effective. It's counterintuitive, but it is very effective. The, what do you do? How do you get rid of that pent up anger? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in that verse, what does He say? He says, Wal kaazimeen al ghaidha wal aafina anin nas. The people, muttaqeen, are those who swallow their anger, but that's not the end of the story. After swallowing their anger, they forgive the people who provoked their anger in the first place. So basically, if you can get yourself to forgive the person who provoked your anger, that is the perfect method to dilute and cause that, all that pent-up anger to, to evaporate. Not only a person angers you, you swallow your anger, and then the next thing that you do is you somehow convince yourself to forgive the person who provoked your anger. If you can do that, you will completely rid yourself, you'll purify your heart and your soul from any ill will or ill feeling towards that person. Now I know this is easier said than done. To, first of all, to solo the anger is such a difficult task. Then Allah on top of that is asking you not only solo it, forgive the person who caused it in the first place. It's not easy. That's why again, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala offers you incentives to be more forgiving. That's why we have so many ahadiths. I'll just share a few. Uh, the Holy Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. Addressing the ummah, he says, Ta'afu fi ma baynakum fa inna al-afwa la yazidu al-abda عند الله إلا عزة. He says, I advise my ummah and I encourage my ummah to try and become more and more forgiving. Try and be as forgiving as you can be because he says, whenever you forgive someone, it doesn't do anything except elevate your status in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The Prophet of Allah also informs us of the munajat that Prophet Musa alayhi salam had with Allah. In that munajat, he asked Allah, he said, Ya Rabbi, man a'azul khalq indak? He said, Ya Allah, among your servants, who do you admire the most? Who do you have the greatest level of respect for? Allah, who does he have greatest respect for? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala responded by saying, A'azzul khalqi indi man idha qadara ghafara. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, the servants that I admire the most and the ones who, for whom I have the greatest level of respect are those of my servants who forgive when they have the power to punish. If you do that, that really elevates your station in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the deal that Allah gives you in the Quran, in Surah An-Nur, Surah number 22, verse number 24, is a beautiful deal. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَلْيَعْفُوا وَلْيَصْفَحُوا أَلَا تُحِبُّونَ أَنْ يَغْفِرَ اللَّهُ لَكُمْ Let the believing men and women, let them become more forgiving. Let them forgive and forget the mistakes of each other. Do you not want Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive you? If you want Allah to be forgiving when it comes to your mistakes and sins, be forgiving to his, his servants and he'll be forgiving to you. And that's why the last tradition that I'll share with you, the Prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam used to say, When it comes to the issue of forgiveness, he used to say, "Iqbalul Udra min kulli mutanassilin, muhiqan kana aw mubtila, wa man lam yaqbal al Udra, fala na lathu shafaati." The Prophet of Allah says, "Accept the apology." of anyone who comes to apologize to you. Whenever someone comes to you, they apologize to you and they offer you an excuse, the Prophet of Allah says, my advice to you, accept it. Muhiqqan kana aw mubtila. Irrespective of whether the excuse that he offers you is a valid excuse or it's an invalid excuse. You see, sometimes many of us have this problem. When people come to apologize to you, you start scrutinizing the excuses that they're giving. You start doing detective work. You become Sherlock Holmes. You're like, no, this excuse is not valid. Prophet of Allah says, no, don't scrutinize the excuses. No matter what excuse they offer you, whether it is valid or invalid, whether it is plausible or implausible, just accept it. And then he gives a warning. He says, وَمَن لَمْ يَقْبَلِ الْعُذْرَ فَلَا نَالَتْهُ شَفَاعَتِي A person who is not in the habit of forgiving those who seek his forgiveness should not expect my shafa'a on the Day of Judgment. Because it is only logical and natural. How do you expect the Prophet of Allah to go out of the way and plead with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive your sins when you were not forgiving when it came to his servants? So really the best and most beautiful medicine and remedy that the Quran prescribes for this problem of anger is forgiveness. If you can somehow bring yourself to forgive the person who offended you in the first place, then that will really neutralize and it will cause your anger to evaporate and it will save you from all those pernicious effects that you would suffer if you did not forgive him and if you did not swallow your anger in the first place. There's a lot of literature that still needs to be covered in this area. Inshallah, we'll try to do it in the coming lectures. We pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give all of us the tawfiq to bring this dangerous and destructive impulse under control and thereby obtain the advantages and benefits that have been promised for that in the life of this world as well as in the hereafter.